Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today earned her B.A. from Notre Dame of Maryland University and her master's in business from Johns Hopkins University. She is a member of the Authors Guild, Eastern Shore Writers Association, Historical Novel Society, and Women's National Book Association. She served on the board of directors of the Maryland Writers Association as communications chair and as president of the Baltimore chapter. Inspired by Shakespeare's What's Past is Prologue, my guest writes stories about poetry intended to influence positive change in our world. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Constance Matsumoto. Hi, Julia. Good morning. It's so nice to be here with you today. Thank you for inviting me to your show. Connie, we're glad to have you. And as always, our opening question is, what took you so long to write your first book? Unlike many of the authors that I've listened to on your program, I am not a creative writer by background. And before 2017, I never imagined that I would write a book. But this story, which is the uh, the true story of my husband Kent's parents, has been important to to me and to Kent to get out into the world um, for at least twenty seven years, which is how long that I've known Kent. And we tried many different paths to have the book published by someone else other than us. But it, for many reasons, that didn't happen. And so in 2017, I I closed my business and I dove into the deep end of the pool of writing, learning the craft of writing, researching um, the, the many, many details that would go into the writing of our book of White Ashes. Well, your husband is your writing partner on this book as well, your your co-author. How does that process work for you too? Because it's it's pretty rare to to interview partners who write books together. So I'm always interested in that process. Yeah, so I guess I'll step back a little bit. We we did try to bring a nonfiction writer. Um, into the mix to, and our my in-laws, Kent's parents had agreed to speak with him um, long before they passed. And they were at our home for lunch and then even before lunch began, they changed their minds. They, they did not want to share their story with him. They didn't want any part of, of him writing the story. And then a few years passed and we um, had met a documentary filmmaker in California who was interested in sharing the story through film. And Kent's parents were again interested in exploring that. And then at the last minute, they changed their minds again. And so for many years, Kent, who was a lawyer um, and a very good writer, said that he would write the book. But he has a very big job and the job always got in the way. And so the years ticked by, and in 2017, a year after my mother-in-law died, and while my father-in-law was struggling with dementia, I decided to 
like I said, jump into the deep end and begin the process. And so that began with me learning the craft of writing, um, truly immersing myself into workshops, reading books. I actually have a, a three ring binder that I've put together. It's a resource book and it's titled in my own handwriting, how to write a novel. And I know that may sound very silly and very um, childlike and immature to um, many authors who have worked hard on their MFA programs, but it worked. It worked for me. It worked for Kent. And then while he was working, I dove into uh, the research, researching militaristic Japan, researching the bombing of Hiroshima. And then together, Kent and I went, we returned to Hiroshima, which is where his father spent um, his childhood until he was 16 years old. Well, he was 16 years old when the atomic bomb fell on his city. He was 19 years old when he left Hiroshima to return to the United States, which is his country of birth. And we saw the city in a different, through a different lens this time. And so we captured the research together that way. Uh, Kent took me to places where his father had taken him in earlier years, um, where the factory was, the other side of the river where the factory was, where his father was working when the bomb fell. The part of the train station, as best as he could recall anyway, underneath of the south and the north stations of Hiroshima, where Kent's grandparents were when the bomb fell. And the, we did those things together. And then returning, I drafted the, um, the early pages of the manuscript. And then Kent edited those pages. And he, at all times, was the cultural lens and the scene brainstormer with me. And then that process continued. We replicated it for his mother's story, which is the Japanese American incarceration. And then it evolved over time, but it was it was a collaborative approach like that. So it wasn't like I wrote a chapter, he wrote a chapter. It was um, quite different and it was really relying on our respective strengths and the time that we had to put into the project. I think that's so important. I think you each have different strengths. We all do. And to be able to mesh those two and to have it work into such a beautiful book is is very impressive. And, you know, your story about your in-laws not wanting to share the story is not unusual because I hear from so many people who are writing memoir that their parents or siblings or family members, you know, don't want to share uh, what's been most painful in their family and and um, some dark secrets, perhaps. So so I'm I'm glad that the story is out there, even if they didn't get to to see it. Yeah, and that's that's a very um, interesting dynamic, a family dynamic that um, I think might be interesting to to touch on. And so to Kent, his parents were just mom and dad. They did not talk about the war years at all, except occasionally when uh, Kent's father's job with the Library of Congress took the family to Japan when Kent was in third grade. And so he went to the American school in Japan from third to 11th grade. And during that time, they would go to Hiroshima at least once a year from Tokyo. And his father would mention certain things. He would show Kent and his brother and sister where he and his brother dug out the bomb shelter in the hill behind the family home and things like that. But he didn't really get into any specific details when Kent was a child. And then when they returned to the United States and even before then, it was really about Kent and his brother and sister having the ability to just have a normal American childhood the one that his parents were really deprived of. And that was so important to his parents. I don't think that they really wanted to bring the trauma of their childhood years and the war years into their children's lives. 
And I, I think that that's um, not unique for World War II, uh, people who are coming out of World War II, and it's certainly not unique for the Japanese American community in this country. We attend pilgrimages, we're very much a part of that community, and it's, it's a theme that resonates throughout the pilgrimages where the elders don't talk about it. It's, it's simply too painful. And there's an element of not wanting to burden their children with it. But yet I was this inquisitive da new daughter-in-law and I asked questions. And because I asked the questions, they were inclined to answer my questions. And my mother-in-law loved to read. She was a teacher. And as different books came out, she shared the books with me. I would read the books. We would talk about them. She would then share what parts of the books resonated with her own experience. And I had that really wonderful, wonderful experience with, with her and, and with my father-in-law. I think that's so very important. I always encourage everyone in a family to to record the voices of their parents or grandparents because I think we lose the voices first in our memories and 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 all of those people like my father too in World War II they didn't talk about the war and I wish now I had been like you and sat down with him and asked more questions. I wish I knew more about his time in those situations. Yeah, I um, I, I feel very blessed that I had those moments with them. What do you think was the most challenging part of, of this artistic process? Uh, the challenging was actually the most fun for me. And that's the puzzle part of, of writing fiction. It's fitting all of the required elements together. Like I said, I had this binder. And within the binder were all these tabs, um, structure, point of view, conflict, um, scene development, characters, um, senses, backstory, dialogue, pace, symbols, all of that. And as the chapters were being constructed, being able to really think about all of those required elements. And it was helpful to me to have, it's going to sound very, very peculiar, but my business background. And because I have a business background, I'm very first process oriented. And um, because of the kind of work that I did early on in my career, very strategic minded. And so I'm a very big picture oriented kind of person. I draw things out on big flip charts, which is what happened with the structure of the book. And then you, I filled things in. And it was like a puzzle to me. How do all of these things fit together? And then for each chapter, how do I make sure all of the required elements are there? And that was the technical piece of it, which I think might come a lot easier for someone who does it a lot more than I ever had, and it just becomes second nature for them. For me, it was, like I said, I just jumped off the high dive into the deep end of this pool and, and figured out how to do it. And so it was just this giant puzzle, and somehow it worked. Well, your binder is your MBA. You taught yourself. And I, I think that's wonderful because I pretty much did the same thing myself. I I um went to all those conferences and classes and 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 took writing retreats and did everything that I could to teach myself about fiction because my background had been communications and public relations, even though I was an English major in college and a master's in education, you, mm -hmm. you still have to teach yourself about fiction. It's a different animal. It, it absolutely is. Well, Connie, why don't you tell us a little bit about the passage you brought to share today and then read from your book so we can hear your tone and voice. Sure. I actually decided to read two very short passages. So the first is the very first page, the very first chapter of the book. 
This is the book of White Ashes. And this is titled Twisted Pearls, 1995. Airborne, no going back. The steady hum of the engines permeated the metal cocoon charged with the choreographed energy of flight attendants executing their routine along the aisles. Ruby studied the diverse spaces on the plane, knowing that when they landed, her physical appearance would blend with the masses. She'd be one of them. At times like this, Ruby wondered why some people found comfort among others who looked alike. For her, being surrounded by mostly Japanese faces was a painful reminder. Flight attendants served drinks. Passengers relaxed into their seats and inhaled deep drags of nicotine. Their journey would be long, and soon the cabin would fill with the fog of cigarette smoke and a cacophony of snores, crying babies, and quiet conversations. Ruby twisted her pearl necklace, thinking she should have asked for tea to settle her queasiness. Breathe, Ruby. You're not a child anymore and haven't been one for decades. Reach for the joyful chapters of your life. Don't let those other chapters dominate your thoughts and ruin this trip. This is important. It's not about you. But as her fingers rolled from one pearl to the next, her thoughts drifted to the moments that strung together her young life so long ago. Those memories had become a part of her. She placed her hands over her stomach to calm the familiar discomfort spinning within, a torment trapped in her body like a black pearl inside of the grip of an oyster, a piece of her enduring, marking her past. The string gave way and the pearls spilled over her lap. And then I'm going to jump ahead about 100 pages. 1943, Jerome, Arkansas. Nothing had prepared her for what she saw when Mahdi raised the shade. The dark sky gave way to a gray dawn behind a tall chain link fence topped with rolled barbed wire. An armed sentry stood at the wood railing of a watchtower surveying their train and the bleak sea of tar paper buildings. His watchful eyes bore through her. She clung to Mahdi. The guard up there is looking at us. He's got a gun. Does he keep people in or out? I don't know. Probably both. At least we're together. Hopefully father will join us soon. No matter what, obey the rules and do what you're told. The train doors opened and a blast of frigid air poured into the car. The soldier shouted, y'all get in line, single file like, good luck. Carrying their belongings, Ruby and Mahdi followed their stepmother off the train onto frozen mud. The biting wind whipped Ruby's hair around. Her cheeks burned with cold. They trekked behind the others over ruts rigid with ice and passed a large sign painted in plain block letters, Jerome Relocation Center. And through the gate where soldiers hoisted a U.S. flag and rendered military salutes. Winter gales sent the flag flapping. Ruby rubbed her arms together and around to get warm and recalled her lessons on what the distinct colors of the flag represented. White for purity and innocence, red for valor, blue for perseverance, diligence, and justice. She jumped at the startling clang of the gate slamming behind them and her sudden realization the guards were there to keep them in, locked behind barbed wire fencing under freedom's flag. Standing in a line that stretched beyond her field of vision, she asked for bravery from any higher power who might hear her and struggled to breathe the air that accentuated the flag's merciless taunts of freedom. Wow, Connie, that's pretty powerful. That is history that a lot of us don't know a lot about. You know, I, I'm so glad you've captured it because... We have seen some horrific times in this country, and I just hope that history teaches us not to repeat them. Indeed. And that's that's what is so important to us with this book. You know, when I would go out to book clubs and talk to young women um, who were much younger than 
than me. And I would talk about my book and adoption and they would question and Um, Why would any woman give up her baby for adoption back in those days? They didn't remember or know about the shame that women were put through in the 50s and 60s if they were pregnant without um, marriage. And, And so there's so much of that history that is being lost if we don't capture it. So I'm just so happy that you did. Thank you. I'm really happy that we did, too. We're very proud of this book. You should be. You know, we writers like to write. We don't always like to promote ourselves, even those of us who've come from marketing backgrounds. Have you found any publicity that has worked for you in this book or maybe something you've tried that hasn't worked? Well, we we did hire a publicist. We we worked with PR by the book in Texas. And we're very happy with their media outreach. And through their efforts, we secured two interviews with NPR. And NPR has been very kind to us and, and to our book. But we we also have done a great deal on our own. Um, because I'm a business person and I, I think about things from that perspective, we have a very comprehensive business plan. And so I, I do think that authors sometimes think that um, publicity for a book is is really just about media publicity and social media. And it's so much more than that. It's, it's where your book is. It's, um, it's, you know, how are you getting it into the hands of your readers? How are you connecting with your readers? And who do you know? And how can you leverage the relationships that you have and who do those people know and that's where we started and those relationships really took us to so many wonderful places including a third NPR interview that we had with big books and and bold ideas um, um, in Minneapolis and we did that on our own Um, and we've done a number of things like that on our own that we're we're very proud of um, and getting into bookstores, that's something that authors have to do on their own. And that means walking to walking into the bookstore, sometimes with your book, sometimes just with a bookmark or a business card, but with a smile and enthusiasm for your book, and no matter where you are, and, and we've done that. And those things have worked for us. What about history museums? Have you gotten the book into any of the history museums in the country? We have. It's currently available for sale at the Japanese American Memorial Museum in Los Angeles. And the um, Japanese American Museum in San Jose had had expressed an interest in the book. I don't know if they've placed their order yet or not, but they said that they had been planning to do that. But that's a great place for this book because people who are there are interested in this topic and they're interested in the humanity of it, not just the facts on the wall, the facts on the wall, or they're on the same, it's the same facts on the same walls pretty much everywhere. The flavor may change based on the city where you are, but our book, we hope, really allows the reader to step into the shoes of this young girl who left her idyllic home in Hawaii and was taken to this frigid cold place in the middle of nowhere in Jerome, Arkansas, and forced to spend three years behind barbed wire um, there and um, it was a combined for years between Jerome, Arkansas, and then later in Tule Lake, California. Um, and, and a lot of that time, she was separated from her father, who was in a Department of Justice camp. And then to imagine what it might have been like to be a 16-year-old boy who survives the bombing of his city, the bombing of, a, of an atomic bomb of his city. And to survive that kind of horror and to be able to move on with his life in such a beautiful way 
the way that my father-in-law did. Well, it certainly deserves um, to be read. And even in Japan and the museums, I think would be a great place. We ha we have the the Museum of the Pacific War with the Nimitz Museum here in Fredericksburg, and there's a Japanese garden here. So it might be a place here in Texas as well for your book. Oh, well, thank you for mentioning that. I will reach out to them. I appreciate that idea, Julia. Was Ruby inspired by your mother-in-law's story? She was, and, and Koji was inspired by Kent's father's story. I love your description of the pearls. I, I think that just grabs us. And I could I could see her on that airplane playing with her pearls and having them spill into her lap. That chapter was added at the 11th hour. It's so funny, the writing process. I started um, with the notion that I, I wanted the book to be bookended in the future. And we, we did work with the developmental editor who suggested that we not do that, that we just jump right into the story. And it was, it was about to go to press when we made that change and, and added that first chapter in because it was missing. It just, it just needed to be there. And I'm so glad that we added it. Ken's so glad that we added it. It really personalized the story and got us um, so involved with Ruby from the beginning. Did you have to complete your research on the war before you started the book or did you do it as you went along? It evolved. We um, did all of the, the, the research that we could on Hiroshima here in the United States before going to Hiroshima. And then having returned from Hiroshima, I put together a very long spreadsheet of all of all of the research notes because my notebooks had just they were just bursting and they were not manageable and so um, a little tip and trick for anybody who's listening that worked for for me was to uh, put it all in a spreadsheet with the topic the source and then the notes and then we were able to sort it by either source or by topic and it was all there on one page. And then we could cut those things up and put them on big flip chart papers when we were putting scenes together so that we made sure that we had everything that we wanted to have in one place when that was being crafted. And then while writing the book, little details would require more research. Was there anything that you had written that you decided didn't belong in the book? I always like to know what hit the cutting room floor. What did you edit out of the book? Um, a couple of big things. Uh, well, one big thing, and that's two sisters. So two characters went away because in reality, Kent's mom had um, three sisters. And in the book, she only has one sister. And then a whole lot of historical data that had just become data dumps on the page. That I think is, is what happens to all of us with our first book. You know, we want to get so much information in there and do um, world creating for the reader, but they're, pre they're pretty smart. They pick it up without us giving them uh, that dump. <laughs> I know, but I learned it all. And I just, I wanted to put it in there. It's all <laughs> such good information. <laughs> Do you have any other books in you? We will see. Um, we will, we will see. We're talking about that now. Um, but for the present, we're not finished with this book yet. We aspire for um, Of White Ashes to be read by many. And what we mean by that is 
we we don't expect to make money on this book. We never wrote it for commercial gain. We wrote this book to honor Kent's parents and the many Japanese Americans who suffered really the worst of the worst during World War II. But we want to touch young readers. And when I say young readers, I mean um, high school students, college age students. And so um, we would like more than anything to be in the schools talking with students about atomic bombings, about the Japanese American incarceration and social justice. And how do we prevent this kind of history from repeating? Because I think, you know, when you share a personal story and, and Kent's talking about these were my parents, this actually happened, then you're bringing history to life. It's not just a page in a textbook and, and a, a student might just kind of glaze over it, but you can really touch their souls and, and, and touch a part of them where maybe they might think a little differently when they're, they're faced with something in the future. And they're, they're faced with a situation where they need to consider someone's point of view that's very different from theirs. And Lord knows we're, we live in a very polarized world right now. And to the extent that we can do anything to help make this world a, a little better place, that, that would make us extraordinarily happy. And so that's really the focus of our energy for right now. But we will see. This was the book that we wanted to write and, and to publish. Well, and that is your writing success. That's what it means to you. And I, I think you've done that uh, so well to leave a legacy. You know, that's what I think is important to many of us is to leave a legacy for our family members, for our friends, for those who don't know us, for them to read this story and to to say, I, I didn't know about that. And I'm so glad that that I do now, you know, when you can say that that we know better now than we should be doing better now. Indeed. Well, Connie, as always, our last interview question is our writers over 50. They're quite a unique group. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? I do. I, I, um, I imagine that many writers um, who are publishing their first books at the age of 50 or above may not have had um, their you know strong backgrounds in writing, but may have embraced this later in life. And so if those writers are looking to publish, if that's a goal, then I think it's important to go into it early on, thinking about your time as the available time that you have to put into your project as, as a pie chart. And maybe spend 50% of your time writing and 25% of your time being a good literary citizen and being involved in that community, developing relationships with other writers, finding people who can be give you feedback, be critique partners, um, tell you when you're really, when something's horrible and you should rip it up or when something's so beautiful that it, it has to stay. And then the other 25% of the time would be learning the business of publishing because it's, it's, very, it's a very challenging business today. And there's many, many paths toward publishing and it's very dependent on what your goals are, the path that one should take. And so that's my suggestion. Great advice today for us. And we're just thankful for this wonderful visit that we've had 
with you so that we could learn about this beautiful book that you and your husband have have written and have gotten out into the world. And I know that so many are going to benefit from reading it. And we're excited to now count you among our authors over 50. Thank you, Julia. This was just such a nice conversation with you. I enjoyed spending this time together. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.